thank uh, Brother Larry and Bill and all them up here and you guys for all the hard work that's involved in putting something like this on and making it happen. Uh, as of the last three to four years, I'm getting an idea of what that actually takes. So it's, it's fun. It's, it's work that is... Is work, by the way. It is work. Now, you young people will be disillusioned. There's work involved. However, it's work that is done for a different motivation than a lot of work. And uh, that's important to uh, to recognize. I've got to get this set where it's out of my view where I can actually read my notes. All right. When I was about five, six years old, it's a long time ago, I'll be 51 this July, so. but uh, when I was about five or six years old, my older sister, Noni, who's not here, she's in the Peoria area, um, talked to me about eternal damnation, talked to me about the lake of fire, talked to me as much as she knew at that age to convey to me, she was five years older than me, what? She was worried about my eternal salvation. And uh, so she conveyed to me, over, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes, that she did not want her little brother to go to hell. Okay? So there was not a whole lot that I understood at five. Kind of like, hey, um, I, uh, I understood that I did not want to go to hell. I understood that I did not want to burn in the lake of fire. And we do need to understand that. We need to understand that there is an eternal destiny one way or the other. It's like the old bumper sticker that says, eternal, how does it say, eternal life, smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> there's a reality of it. Okay, or vaping. No, I'm just kidding. But um, there, there is, is a whole lot there uh, involving testimony because at five years of age, I did not understand eternal security properly. I understood that I was safe from the lake of fire, but I did not understand all that went with that. Okay? By the time I was about nine, I was starting to get enough exposure to teaching, to understanding. You know, just say, by the way, guys, adults, older people, little people in the pew can understand far more than we fathom sometimes. Okay? So at the age of nine, I started to understand some of the concepts of uh, why my decision to believe wasn't just something on my part, but rather something that God would keep. Not something that I would keep, but something that God did. There's a verse over there in Philippians 1.6 that says, He who hath begun a good work in you. That's God. It wasn't something that I did. It was something that His Son did on the, and dying on the cross for my sins. And when I realized that, it was very freeing for me at nine or so years of age to realize that there wasn't anything I could do and there wasn't anything I could do to keep the salvation that God gave me in the sense of I had to work for it, okay? It was done by, as my sister's song says, faith alone, okay? So those things are blessed truths. I mean, you can look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So uh, those years, in between 9 and 12 and 13, um, we, at a young age, there was five of us kids, five of us siblings, the one sister that's here, obviously, and myself, uh, being, uh, I guess you would say, a whole lot closer, both in age and also in ideals in life and goals, uh, went through some of the same things spiritually around the same time increments. And uh, going to Christian camps, going to uh, conferences. My dad was a, a grace minister. We're second generation grace believers. Our, our kids are third generation grace believers. We believe, I should say, I personally believe that the principles in Proverbs that talk about raising kids and taking responsibility for how you are able to teach them uh, are still applicable for today. And uh, for that reason, we take our responsibility seriously. 
Okay? Not that we can dictate what they do, but that we have a responsibility to give them the truth that they want. Okay? So anyway, in those 10 years, we struggled through some things, we went through some things, and then, um, oh, about age 22 or so, I went through some struggles, physically and, I guess you would say, emotionally and spiritually. A lot of times, notice how that happens. In the physical struggles that we go through in life, who takes advantage of that? Satan. The God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, comes down there and says, ah, there's a weak one. <laughs> He's hurt. And when we realize that in your Christian life, you need to know when you're weak. Can I say that to you? We need to know when we're not doing so good. And I don't just mean physically, although that does play a factor. We need to know when we're not doing so good spiritually. Okay? So in those teen years, late teen years, we went to a camp, I don't even know what year it was, 86 I want to say, 85, 86, and uh, they taught on Romans 12, 1. Okay? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, right? And I remember looking back at that, the influence that that year's camp had on different ones that year, self-included. And uh, but as I move forward into my future, into my late teens, into my early twenties, and I struggle through some of the things that some of us go through. Not that we have to, by the way, but that we sometimes make bad decisions and have to reap what we sow. We don't have to make bad decisions. I had a guy tell me one time on the phone, well, you know, I just hadn't learned that yet. I had to go through that to learn that. I said, no, you don't. We've got a Bible. We've got God's Word that tells us the way that God is about it. We don't need, we don't have to go through bad decision-making processes in our life so we can learn. What a cop-out. What an excuse for bad decision-making processes that we make in life. That's just not true. There's a little quote years ago that I heard. It says, if God's against it, so am I. Well, you got to know God's against it, don't right? you? You just got to know He's against it. How do you know that? Oh, well, you got to read you got to know some things. How many years has Brother Jordan been saying, your Christian life will not operate on the basis of ignorance? If there are some things in God's Word that you don't know pertaining to how you need to live your life to glorify God, get in there and find out. Rub elbows with somebody that's been around a little longer in the Word. Back some questions around. Look the verses. All you need to study, by the way, is the Word of God, a good, strong concordance, and a Bible, a notebook, and a pen, and a worldly mind. Okay? So anyway, Romans 12, 1 had a huge effect on my life. But you know what I found out? Over time, you know what I found out? Romans 12, 1 will never be done in your life until you apply Romans 12 to them. It took me years to find out that. I hear some of these testimonies and they say, it took this time, it took that time. I now understand some of those things. Because verse 2 says, and, see that conjunction is to tie those two thoughts together. And, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Proving out the will of God in your life. If you have a heart's desire, there's two decisions that you make here on this planet that are hugely important, okay? The first one being to your decision to believe the gospel of the grace of God for yourself as an individual. 
like my sister wrote the song, you can be raised in a Christian family, but that doesn't do it, does it? It's your decision before a just and righteous God to agree with God about that righteous sacrifice His Son did on the cross for your sins as an individual. You trust in that. It's not enough to hear 50 million other people that you may know or believe. It's a personal decision between you and a just and righteous God. Very important. But that's the first decision you make in your life. There's another decision. The Romans 12, 1 decision. Recognition of the fact that the whole world is not about you. Wow. Appreciate my nephew's song like that. It's not about you. It's all about Christ. Understanding that there's a purpose. There's goals. There's things that God uniquely designs in us, in our head first, and then, yes, in our hearts, to where it gets to the seat of our emotions. Did you know God cares about what you feel? Oh, don't get me wrong. He says over there in Jeremiah 17, 9, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't use the excuse that you can't figure out why you feel. Okay? What does Hebrews 4, 12 say? That the Word of God has the power to discern the thoughts and intents of it. Your motivation is important. God is interested in what you feel. And why you feel. Your feelings are motivated. One way or the other. Alright. I'm preaching on my notes. Sorry. Romans 12, 2, 12 1 will never be done in your life until you apply Romans 12 2. Many of us think about our testimony being what we personally are saved from. Okay? Again, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not knowing yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved from the eternal lake of fire, praise God. We're saved from the, from the ramifications of sin, of the sin seed that we're born with. But there's much more than that. Okay? What is that second facet of your salvation? What does it mean over there in Philippians 2.12 when it says, work out your own salvation? What's that mean? You already got it. It's not an issue of working to get it. You already have it as a believer. Okay? You are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.3. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2. There's plenty of passages that refer to what God does when you become a believer. He calls you a child of God. Galatians 3.26. He says you're a new creature. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If all that's true, and it is, that God does an operation on you, Colossians 2, all things are true, why is that? Just so we can kind of coast through life and come out on the other end of it when the rapture comes back and God takes us up to heaven? Can I tell you, if that's all you understand, you're missing something. Because we as Christians are uniquely designed by God to appreciate far more about what He's doing in the whole universe. Look at it. The creation of the world. God creates the world. Then He puts these little, He puts dirt and water together, makes mud, and makes a man. Now the woman was at least made from rhythm. <laughs> but the interesting part about all that is He had a purpose. He had a plan before the creation of the world. He predetermined that He was going to make 
the body of Christ. That's us, guys. That's us. And the body of Christ was uniquely designed through the indwelling Holy Spirit to know how to do some things. To know how. You know, what was Christ here for when He was here, physically? He was here to do the Father's will. When He left, He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And He performed the will of the Father in a physical body, even as deity. That's why. Okay? But when he left, who is left here in Satan's domain, right? To perform the will of the Father. To do God's perfect will. Us. Us. And that's God's plan. Now look at Romans chapter 8 real quick here. Romans chapter 8. Verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. So it starts out right away. You got to know something, right? And we know that all things work together for good. Did you know for years I thought that good was mine? Oh, it's going to work out for my good. <laughs> Wait a minute. All things work together for good to them that love God. How often do we talk about God loving us? And He does. But how often does Paul reiterate that mindset? How often does the Apostle Paul say, Hey, the love of Christ constrains you. How often does he say in Philippians 1, 9, 11, that your love may abound? How's it going to do that? When does my love, what I personally want, desire, change from what I want to do to what God wants from me? When I read God about what God says, when I start learning me, there's a learning curve there. That's not something that happens overnight. When you become a Christian, what you do after that point, is you start understanding about the identity truths, about who you are in Christ, your position in Christ. And those are glorious truths. They're awesome. But when you start learning about that, when you learn what God says that you personally can do, not in the energy of your flesh, but what he can do in the body? Colossians 1.27, brother read it earlier. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't think that glory is there is talking about when we get to heaven. That old southern, I'm from the south originally. That old southern term, glory! You know, people get excited and yell and jump up and down. I tell the guy the other day, I saw a guy one time in, at a tip camp beating, pick up a water bill and they go running back across the stage. And another guy climbed up all kinds of crazy stuff. All right. We called them Bapticostals. They were kind of in between <laughs> Pentecostals. And, but you know what? I don't know about you guys, but as a second generation grace believers, we need to be able to understand that separation in between head knowledge and heart knowledge, okay? Should you personally have some zeal in your life, have some fervor in your life about what you know? Paul told them in Galatians, it's good to be zealously affected in a good thing. I don't know about you, but I like to get zealously affected. I know that a lot of times we can't be motivated until we agree with God about what God says. And, and God uses other, like the lady said a minute ago, God uses other people in the body of Christ sometimes to kind of tap on your skull, you know, and say, hello, 
anybody in there? Anything going on in there? And, and we need that sometimes. And uh, can I say nicely, if I can do that for you from here, I'll do that. Okay? You that know me well know I'll try. Okay? But I want to do it in the right attitude. I want, I want to... The Bible says that the method for growing up the saints, Ephesians chapter 4, I a song about this, so I'm going to take it there, all right? Ephesians chapter 4. Look at this list here, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Saints can be perfected! What a concept, right? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. When, when the local assembly gets to the point where the saints are coming forward and willingly asking for things to do. But wrong. It's no different than raising kids. When the kids get to the point where they're accepting responsibility, great. But when are they coming to you and asking, what, what needs to be done? What can I do to help? You know what? The wrong one. It's easy to take care of yourself. Pack my clothes, put my stuff in my bag, haul it out to the van. I'm done. Sit down on the couch. We're done. We got all this other stuff. My wife packs a week before we leave. I'm like, okay, I pack the morning up. But I make a master list of prioritization and things that I know that if I do forget them, I'm going to wish I had especially when you have all this stuff going on. So, but priorities are huge. I, I think I taught on that last year. And, uh, but what I found, look at this process here. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. The unity is not about whether you and I agree. We don't hold hands and sing kumbaya. Okay? Kumbaya. There's much more. It goes a lot deeper than that. The unity... It's the unity of the faith. Okay? Unity of the faith. And it says over there in, in the beginning of the chapter, endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith. Let me see how I can just quote this here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Is there unity in the Spirit? That's what it says. But why does it say endeavoring to keep it? Because we all have the flesh. The reality of the old man. Romans 7, right? So he says, endeavoring to keep. And he says again over there in Philippians 1, 27, striving together. Most of the time when we're striving, can I be honest with you? Most of the time when we're striving in a local assembly, what kind of striving are we doing? Okay. And that's us. That's our flesh. Okay, that's the Barney. That's the old man, right? But here, in Philippians 1.27, it says striving together. Brother Ray made that comment about working together. The camaraderie involved in that. You sweat the people. I'm telling you, you learn something about it. Boy, isn't one. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. There's a little camaraderie in that. Okay? There's a little unity there. So go down to, four, uh, go down to verse thir uh, 14, yeah. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in the him in all things. I was reading that the other day and it says in all things. I've heard for years the thing about grace is you learn to apply the doctrine to the details of your life. Can I tell you nobody else can do that for you? Mm -hmm. Try. But the way that you owe what you personally believe. Your Bible says that God would that 
man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Why is that? Why can't I come up behind somebody else and follow along what they're doing all the time? God wants you as an individual to have a personal relationship with Christ. To grow up into Christ. That's why Paul told the Corinthians, he didn't want to have dominion over their faith. But what did he say? He wanted to be helpers of the joy. I'm like, wow, that's, that's rough, that's hard. As a, can I tell you as a minister, this guy's no, as a minister, that's hard. You don't always know how much to speak the truth and how much to speak the truth in love. Slow down. You want to get the weed whipped off and just <laughs> right? <laughs> Weeds don't they'll grow right back on you if you don't hold on by roots. It takes a whole lot longer and there's a whole lot more pulling to do if you want to do something right. I mean, sometimes physical analogies don't make very good illustrations. I don't believe I can pull anybody's weeds out of their heart, okay? That's their decision to do that, okay? And I don't know what weeds you got in your life that's between you and God. You know, I don't believe in teaching legalism. Those comparing themselves by themselves are what? Not lies, right? I just want to remind you of some scriptures that say certain things. But he says that the ingredients for growing up is speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, into Christ, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. But when you see things like that, you say, we're not just saved from the eternal empire. But we're saved to something. We're not just saved from, but we're saved to. When you read Ephesians 2, 8, 9 about the gift, and you read Ephesians 2, 8, 9 about it, not being by works, right? Keep reading. Read Ephesians 2, 10. What does that say? We are His workmanship. That means He did it. Okay? He's the one that radically changed us. Right? Calls us a new creature. A child of God. And He says we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. <gasps> works are an issue? Oh. Only after you personally changed radically by God. Okay? He does an operation on you. And He makes you a new creature. That's why He can turn around and say to you, Be not conformed to this world! But be transformed. Now go back to Romans 8. Because I didn't finish over here. Romans chapter 8. But I get preaching all over it, so I'm sorry. Romans chapter 8. Read about the purpose, okay? You know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. His purpose, Romans 8 20. His purpose. Every time I read that, I think of that guy, Rick Warren, who wrote that book, The Purpose Driven Life, right? I might have purpose in my life. I might have goals in my life. Things that Barney wants to get done. But what is this talking about? God's purpose. There's a whole lot more going on in life than what I personally want to do. Can I tell you, when you realize that, Romans 12, 1 means a whole lot more to you. But like I said, there came a point in my life where I was looking back through the pain and the suffering and the bad decisions that I personally made in my life. And I was going, what, what, what? Because there's that point back there in 1987, the, the 86, whenever that year was, that I chose to write my name at the bottom of the page and let God fill it in. That's the phrase. 
That's a beautiful decision to make. And I recommend that you get to that point in your life where you're actually ready for to allow God to make those decisions for you. But you know what? He won't come down and grab you by the nose, clip a leash on the end of your nose, and jerk you around in life. That's not how He leads you. So then, He says, be a living sacrifice. Then what does He say? Be not conformed to this world. Ah, oh, that means I can't do what I want to do. It's not about me. No. Be not conformed to this world. But be transformed. Transformed. I mean, changed radically. Yeah. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed. How? By the renewing. Not a one-time thing, guys. Not a one-time thing. The renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may prove progressively. Not one time. You can write your name at the bottom of the page. You can put the little sins on a piece of paper and put them in a balloon of helium and let them fly away to the sky. And all those little things that these churches do Okay, which a lot of them are well-meaning, okay? You can even write your personal sins down and stick them in the fire and light a match and burn them, okay? But if you don't understand Romans 12 too, you won't know how, okay? What's it say over there? Oh, Abby put that in her song. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that every one of you should know how. Know how! Every time I read that, I'm like, wow, there it is again. We should know how to possess your vessel, that's your body, in sanctification and honor. Honor. Never look, by the way, if you're in ministry of any kind, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can be vacuuming the church, you can be cleaning the pews, you can be cleaning the bathroom, you can be dumping garbage, you can be straightening that little rubber rug that keeps moving back by the back door. I straightened it twice. That's part of the OCD. Don't find it <laughs> that thing's creeping away every time I walk by. I'm like, what? Really? Everybody's got one of those somewhere in their house, right? A creeper, a rug that moves by itself, you know? But, but anyway, the point is, it doesn't matter what the mundane things are that you do in life. Did you know you can do them to glorify God? You can do dishes to glorify God. And that's a hard thing for me to say. I do not like doing dishes. Okay? I did dishes three, three and a half years in a deli. Industrial dishes. Very brutal, okay? Hard on the back. But the point is, even the mundane things that you do in life, you can do them to glorify God. Now having said that, some of you people probably have talent, abilities, and I'm not talking about musical or whatever, although you have that too. You don't even know it sometimes. I love getting people to sing that claim they never sang in public. Is there something about it? This is fun. But anyway, um, you, uh, God needs people that are willing. Okay? It doesn't matter what it is. My dad taught us, tried to teach us for years. There's a significant difference in a person who can see what needs to be done and a person who's actually willing to do something about it. Okay? And uh, for me, at my age, I appreciate people, and I can see them from a distance, that just do things. And you're, you're like, how did that get done? It's like there was an elf overnight or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like the work that's being done just in the short time we've been here already. And you come in and this and this and this is going on, you're like, you know, Larry opens the refrigerator and there's tons of food in there. And Larry's, you know, like expediting the situation, trying to figure out. And we got, you know, I, uh, by the way, i got to say this, by the way, a commercial. 
I was holding the pot of gravy for Larry to, no, Larry was dumping the pot of gravy into that little slow cooker. And he says, here, grab that spatula. It was all I could not, all I could do not to just reach that spatula up there because it was this huge glob of gravy, all right, just big like, I wanted to just go, <clears throat> And it would have been all over the front of Larry. You know, I, just, I was so tempted. I, I told him because I thought it was funny. You know, I didn't do it. But I'm just saying, I had to share that thought. And he, 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 in camaraderie, uh, let me know a couple of other things people have done to him in the past. And we were kind of laughing about it. But it was just, you know, those little things like that. The things that when we come together, we need to think about what we can do to help each other. And uh, I don't know about you, but even in our little church, sometimes when we come together, you have, there's a tendency to look around and see what's wrong. Okay? Well, I would like to get to the point, even as a speaker a lot of times, I don't speak all the time, but, uh, that I can try to think of what I can do to help somebody else out, but I'm not behind the pulpit. Okay? When I'm not singing or something. Okay? Can I hold a cup? Can I do this? Can I do that? The everyday mundane things. It's an attitude of service. And that's what God wants from us. And that's why he says, he calls it vessels of honor. Over there in 2 Timothy 2. You ever think about the things that you do being something that is honorable? Or just in my just God. I don't think about that. I've been in a place in my life at one time where Barney sang for the glory of Barney. Well, I got a two and a half octave rating. I can sing this. I can sing so and so, whatever. And people come up and tell me how good I am. You know what? It wasn't very satisfying. We are all uniquely designed to give of ourselves, but not for selfish motivation. Okay? My dad taught us that we could stand up. If you're up there on a platform saying or singing, doing something, you're up there to glorify God. Well, it's no different no matter where you're at. We're literally uniquely designed by God to glorify God. What's 1 Corinthians 10 31 say? Whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, how do I clean the toilet? How do I plunge that toilet again for the glory of God? You do it with the right heart attitude. Start to get flesh, you'll get a better plunger. <laughs> but uh, you can you can do things that God looks at as honorable, scraping the rocks to the edge. Whatever it is that you're doing in your life environment, putting up with the idiosyncrasies of unethical work practices at a large grocery chain, okay? Whatever it is you do, you can be a testimony, a living epistle of an honorable thing that God has given you to do. Is it easy? Yes and no. It's easy because it's easy to understand, but it's hard because Barney gets in the way. My flesh doesn't want to do it today. Okay? I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I only have one side of the bed I can wake up on. It's small. <laughs> Large bed in a small bedroom with a lot of stuff. Actually, some of it's out right now, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I, I get out all over the end of the bed. Okay? If my wife gets out on the anyway. But, uh, it doesn't matter what side of the bed you wake up on. The goals are still the same. And we can't make excuses for ourselves when we don't fill up. Okay. 
I think I preached this page. Let me see what the second page says. Okay, I preached most of that already too. But I've been there. I, I've been in the bar scene, guys. I'm a second generation grace believer that knew better that literally went out and sang for the glory in a bar scene with a bunch of unbelieving whatever, okay? Why? What a waste. What a waste. I know what it means to be addicted to pornography. I know what it means to have to go before my children and tell them that dad's got a problem that he needs fixed. That dad's going to have to go get some help because he wasn't doing what he needed to do in life. I think it's important, like Dave's song said, to be honest. God can use you. God can use a broken vessel in such a way that you would never believe. When the vessel breaks, the light shines out. And that's what God wants. He doesn't need prideful people. He needs humble people. I started uh, pursuing better things. I quit running around with the unbelieving people that I was trying to help with their problems, which was a waste of effort. And uh, I bumped into people that actually want to talk about the Word of God. I met a Methodist. I met a person that was going to the vineyard. I met a person that... And, and we started these impromptu Bible studies at Hardy's, of all things, where I met my wife. I didn't meet my wife in a bar, okay? I didn't end up with that person that I was chasing that was an unbelieving waitress, okay? Praise God. A lot of that I owe to a godly mother, actually. I never gave, and I hope I'm not bragging, I never gave a girl a flower until it was the girl that was to be my wife. But I can thank my relationship with my mom for that. I have a godly mother. Still do. And she's the only person I ever gave a flower to. When you give somebody something, it should mean something. When you give somebody your feelings, when you convey yourself to somebody, it's important. Save it. Save it. Don't spend it wantonly. When you can't recoup it. Don't get to the altar of marriage and say, well, I gave part of my heart to Christy, and I gave part of my heart to Julie, and I gave part of my heart to Brad, and I gave part of my heart, well, I've really only got about this much left, and it's pretty messed up. I don't really know how to love. <laughs> don't get married to somebody, and a year later have her come home and say, you know what, I don't love you anymore. I've talked to people that's done that. That's why Romans 12.1 will never be done in your life until you start applying Romans 12.2. And you look at that individual and you say, you know what? That individual is conforming themselves with the world. And you make a decision. Boy, that's a hard decision to make. A guy in our, in our local assembly recently made that decision. He drew a line in the sand. He said, if God is against his son, and he looked at that person that he cared about, and he said, I can no longer be around you. Praise God for people with some conviction in life that want to do what's right before a just and righteous God. Is that easy? No. It's not supposed to be easy. It's really not. Life is not going to be easy. The most valuable things you ever do in life take time and your heart. <laughs> That's just the way it is. There's an old song that says it's not an easy road. That's not. So instead of being lazy, 
realize that. This is not an easy road. God does things for a reason. He gives us a vocation to be for it. And he says that we're bought for the price in order to glorify God in our lives. I knew that. I made that decision. But I didn't know the why. Romans 12, too. Okay. If any of you guys down there are interested in, in understanding the principles of Romans 12, 1 and 2, don't forget verse 2. If your heart's desire is to do something in ministry, to serve God, that's Romans 12, 1. But please do not forget Romans 12, 2. And you read in Colossians 3, the put off things, where he says, put off all these anger, wrath, not blasting, put all these bad things. What does he do? He doesn't stop there. God doesn't intend on stripping you of everything your heart's desire wants to do and not give you something to do. Okay? He says, but put on charity. He says, let. He's not going to make you, by the way. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you poorly. No, preacher! Sit your way. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's a beautiful thing. And when it does that, can I tell you, it'll change you. Whether you want it to or not, it'll change you. And you get in the Word of God. And you read in your mind. You start proving out the will of God in your life. You become an honorable vessel, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. That's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to share with you the concept of something that. Yes, I made the decision to believe the gospel of the grace of God for myself. Five and assurance at nine. Yes, I made the decision at, I don't know, 16, 18 years of age, 1986, to serve God in my life. I had full intentions of doing those things, and I started writing songs. That's when I wrote the only way to happiness is serving the Lord. I knew that. But I didn't understand the ramifications of application. I didn't understand life application principles of Romans 6, 7, and 8. So I found myself in that verse over there in Romans 7 that says, how to perform that which is good, I find not. Okay? So there's an issue of knowing. There's an issue of comprehending. And there's an issue of learning. So when we learn the more we learn. Did you know, i got to say this, I say this a lot, but your flesh, the old man, naturally prohibits growth in order to be less responsible to the truth. Did you know that? I found it to be true in my life. And I'm not doing well. I don't want to decide. When I'm not doing well, my flesh, my personal relationship with Christ suffers. It doesn't suffer because he's holding that. It suffers because I'm holding that. So we need to be aware of that about ourselves. And uh, just realize that the life that we live in the flesh, we're to live by the faith of the Son of God. He loved us. Himself for us. So the life application principles, all those years later, played full circle in my own life. Got my heart cleaned out a little bit, got my head stomped on a little bit, sat at tables with 14, 15 men, poured my heart out to them. And I recommend that actually. <laughs> about the problems that I personally had that I was going through, okay? I got honest with it, okay? And a few years later, 
some things started happening. About eight years ago, <coughs> my wife and I were to the point to the point in our uh, in our Bible studies that we had been teaching the Word of God on uh, I think Sunday for I don't know eight years or so, and it was just my wife, my kids, and I in our in our house. Okay. And then we would visit other other believers during the week. Well, I have finally got to the point where, you know what? If we can't get a local assembly going, I gotta do this somewhere. I'll uproot. I'll go someplace else. Anything. I I go to Walmart. I can transfer. And I call people. And I got a hold of people. And I started talking to people. And what do you need over here? You need somebody that can teach. You need somebody that. Well, what do we do? We need to do something. I need to do something progressively. Okay, move forward somewhere. Okay. Well, in that process, things start shaking. Get a little bit out of your comfort zone, trying to look for something to do to be active. In that process, we bumped into Jeff and Trish down in the St. Louis area. Ended up, long story short, they moved up to our area. Then the Hindus moved. We we all we all got together and sought unity of the faith. We started a little local assembly, and it reminded me of something that a preacher said up in uh, Chicago once one of the conferences. He says, you know what? There's grace believers all over the place that don't have a local sin. I bumped into some in Ohio last month. And I, he says, you know why there's not a grace church in your area? Because you haven't started one. And I was like, oh, wow, that was rich. I took it to heart. I must have. It's been 20 years since he said it, and I still believe it. So we did that. We got going on it. We got some motivation. We moved forward. We did what we needed to do. Okay? Can I tell you that I feel like right now, despite my own inadequacies, my own baggage, that the last, say, five years of my life, I've been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay? Not because I'm the be all and end all. Okay? Make that clear. But because I'm being used. Because I'm being a vessel. Because God desires to use us. We're happiest, for lack of a better term, when we're allowing ourselves to be used to help others with the truth. We're just happier that way. So, I hope, I hope in testimony you, you grasp where I'm coming from. Because it's so real. God's word is really designed to affect how you think and affect what you do. But you can glorify God in that word, right? Okay. We didn't end up going anywhere. We're still in the PR area, which is a good thing now, okay? And our church has grown for some reason. Okay? Glory be to God. Praise God. Mm -hmm. So that's my testimony. A little bit. Um, but long story short, or short story long, depending on how you take it, um, it means a lot to me to be able to share a principle of how the Lord works in, in my life, okay? Because He desires to work in our lives. And he will. You know, the only thing that prevents God from working in your life is us. It's the only thing. One more verse and I'll quit. Romans 8 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor present. I'm not going to quote it right in there. Look at it. That's from getting up at 4.30. Romans 8. I, I looked at this verse differently a while back. And, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't it a comforting thing to know that God is not going to withhold His love from you? It is. It's a very comforting thing. But notice in this list, this is a pretty long list. Who is not listed in this list? Kind of a trick question. The individual reading it. Okay? Notice when he says any other creature. Did you know that as a Christian, sometimes you can willingly separate yourself from the love of Christ. He didn't go anywhere. He's going to keep His promises. He's not withholding any blessings from you, but you can walk away from Him. Doesn't that explain a lot to you? It explained a lot to me when I look back and I look at that time in my life when I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. That's not what God's love wants. God's love wants us to be constrained. Right? And then I found over there in Ephesians 3 where it says, to know the love of Christ which has the knowledge. It's something that we're supposed to grow into. The love of Christ. That same love of Christ. That supposed to know the You know, we reciprocate that. When we get it, we give it back. We shape other people. When we learn what God through Christ has done for us, we can share that with other people. It's not something you sit on. Okay? And uh, the more we learn that, the more, how can I say, the more vulnerable you're willing to be. The only thing that keeps you from being honest or vulnerable towards other people is pride. Okay? The, the motivation behind somebody that would manipulate or lie to you is to protect themselves. Okay? That's not what God wants for us. It's hard to be vulnerable. It is. Jesus, thank you for all you us. Thank you for giving us your truths. Help us to desire to renew our minds in them. To learn more about you and to learn to apply those things in our lives. We pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's stand. It's almost time for lunch.